My special guest, Stuart Gibbon, is a former senior detective and now a much sought-after crime-writing consultant and author. Throughout this series, we're going to be exploring his police career, his writing work, and how procedurally accurate the bill was. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this fascinating series of podcasts. And then I decided I was going to go into CID. It wasn't an easy job. It was like an apprenticeship. You had to do all sorts. You basically went and sat on an interview with like a panel and they ask you loads of questions. Why do you want to be a detective? What skills have you got? You know, the usual sort of interview questions. If you got through that, you then went on as kind of like an apprenticeship or a trainee scheme where you were still a technically a PC, a uniform PC, but you started wearing scruffs, plain clothes, shirt and tie, and you worked in an office with the detectives. And again, you were kind of helped by experienced detectives. It was like, it took about two or three years because I, I got posted on squads and the robbery squad and the burglary squad and all these sort of things. And they were good because you worked in plain clothes and you went out in plain vehicles. You did the surveillance on people. I mean, that was all really good stuff. And that's what I really enjoyed. And I thought, well, I like this. This is kind of for me. I like to do this sort of work. It, it was tough. You did long hours. You dealt with a more serious crime, of course, but it was interesting. Uh, and I really got involved in that. And then I went for me sort of final interview after two, two and a half years and managed to get through that um, and was accepted as a, as a DC. Wow. Oh, so you're like the real life Jim Carver. You know, that's what he, that was his yeah. journey. Look, maybe, I mean, I must admit, I didn't, I did go for an interview when I had about three or four years service to do undercover work, surveillance, proper, you know, the proper surveillance, not the, the local, but the, like, the ones that follow the organised criminals around the country. But I was very young in service and I had a good interview, I thought, but they said, you know, you need to go away and learn a bit more about your career. It was too early for me, but it was positive feedback. But then that was, so that was an early stage where I was thinking plain clothes work maybe for me, maybe. And then, of course, later on with the, with the burglar incident and a couple of other things, I just thought, yeah, I like the sound of being a detective. That sounds really quite good. And, and of course it was, but what that meant then was I was I wasn't going to stay where I was when I was when I became a, a DC. You had to move somewhere else, and I'm, I'm trying to remember whether I got. I don't even think I got a choice to be honest. To where I went, I think it was just you're going here. And actually, for me, it wasn't likely to be South London or anything. It was going to be within a geographical region of where you lived anyway, to be to be reasonable. But they all they did was sent me across the other side of the North Circular Road, and I was now working in um, in Kilburn. Kilburn and Harleston and Wilston Green. So literally, it was, just, it was actually the same division. It was just kind of the other side of the road. And I was a detective. Um, and again, you couldn't make this up because this would never happen, I don't think, nowadays, not in the way it did. But I turned up for my first day as a DC and I met the DS who said, oh, how are you doing? I was now still George, but trying to convince people that my first name is Stuart. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't always easy. Sometimes it was easy just to leave it as it was. And he said, oh, thank you. Great to see you. By the way, I'm acting as a DI at the minute, so I won't be a sergeant. He said, and, the, and there's you and a, another DC that's just starting. The most experienced of you two will be the sergeant. And I kind of looked at him and I looked at Neil, who was the new lad who, who I got on really well with. And I knew that I had more years service than him because he was quite young in service. And I had been at Wembley quite a few years. Right, you're the, you're going to be the acting DS from now. Day one, day one at the at the new Nick at the DC, about to learn the trade of a DC. I don't mean I've done a lot of it before, but I'm now a DC, so you get uniform officers coming at the office looking for a detective to help them, you know. And I'm now in charge of a team of about six or seven DCs, and I'm like, wow, wow. It was a bit of pressure really because I'd never anticipated that, and I think that was because I'd I'd done the exams for sergeant and I'd managed to pass most of them. And I was just waiting for an interview. So I was qualified to be a sergeant, but I hadn't really done it before. I hadn't done it before. And now I was an acting DS. And basically, I just got stuck in like with the DC and me and Neil, this little lad, worked as a team, really, as a couple. And the others got, we all mucked in. But I was effectively in charge and I had to do their appraisals and, you know, all that. I was just basically being go to the meetings and stuff like that. But it was just, and that, that was a whirlwind period of time for me where it was like you know not only have I got to learn to be a DC now but I've, I've got to learn to be a sergeant a DS as well albeit I'm acting I, I did it for quite a while actually and stayed in that sort of area for, for a few years before I moved away from London 
great experience for me because then when I did go for sergeant, what what a thing to be able to say. Well, I've, I've been doing the job for like two or three years. You know, I, I doesn't mean to say I'm good at it necessarily, but I've got the experience of supervising staff. You know, dealing with difficult decisions, managing this and doing that. But what a, I mean, I was gobsmacked. I went home the, after that first day, and I just like, this, what's going on? What is this? A wind up. You know, I'm like, going to go in tomorrow, and they're going to say, oh, we were just testing you out. Then <laughs> you're not going to be a DS. You're a DC, but we just wanted to see how you'd react. But it never happened. And I had to go to see the DI as the as the team leader, if you like. Unbelievable. How many cases would your department have been working on? Like, what was the workload actually? Well, like? it was quite big. I mean, I, I think me and Neil were probably I, I, I ranged between fifteen and twenty cases in one go at one wow. time. I would suggest probably most of the others were round about that. I would say not all the time, but that the average was probably about ten. I would say, and they could be anything from burglaries, arson, GBH. You know, the, the top end, maybe the odd robbery. Um, if they didn't have a squad to help out, drugs. So the real, the real top end of the crime side that Uniform didn't deal with. So yeah, really high workload. Every day was there was jobs coming in every day, and we was on call as well. We did night night duty CID, which I loved because again I, I quite enjoyed doing night duty. And as the CID, we if we didn't have anything to do, particularly at that time because it was the middle of the night, we'd go out and patrol. We'd take the unmarked car out and we were scruffed up anyway with jeans, t-shirts, whatever. And we'd just go looking for criminals and that sort of thing. So that was great. But most of the time in the office, shirt and tie, you know, smart, presentable. That included going to court for cases. We spent a lot of time at Crown Court with serious cases. You know, it was such a mixture, but it was just a whirlwind because that, that period when I was in that division was just, it never seemed to slow down. It just always seemed to be rolling over it was, it was unbelievable really i worked at itv for a couple of years on this morning and the very first assignment i got was to go to birmingham and, and shoot overnight with the police unit and one minute these two guys were just chatting about the rugby and then we we're in a 110 mile an hour car chase on the motorway and i'm just holding this camera like this green sort of you know it's my first week at itv and suddenly i'm filming a car chase yeah. And then another car got them, and then they were just like chatting about rugby again. I was just like, "Whoa, you know, it's so." I suppose anything can happen yeah. at any moment, and and you you can't predict it, which must take some getting used to. So it's it's quite, it's quite a unique way to live, isn't it? And to it operate, is. yeah, it is. It always keeps you on your guard, and you feel sometimes that you can't really relax, or you can't switch off. Not you know during those duty hours. Like you say, one minute you can be having your fried breakfast in the canteen, which we used to we used to call it a nine nine nine, funny enough. Um, <laughs> and, and you know the big <laughs> the big breakfast, and the call comes in, and and you it's there and you've gone, you know, and you and you're on your way there, and you might be there within a minute or two, and you've got to deal with like a really serious situation. So yeah, it, it's one of those where you can have a laugh, and I think you have to do that. You have to have these things that you can these people you can bounce off, and these these situations that you can use to de-stress but whilst you're at work it's it's one of those where it's like you know you just switch like that and you can be having a laugh at one point in the car and then the call comes in and everything changes you know and you, you just kind of you go to the job and, and kind of get on with it really uh, it took some getting used to i must admit oh yeah you... and and did was pace introduced during your uh, at what point in your timeline quite, quite early come? actually yeah quite early yeah right. Um, I'd heard some stories about how interviews used to go before pace with right. paper and you know all this sort of thing and how people used to be put in cells and whatever and left for lengthy periods of time and all those. I've never experienced any of that, but I'd heard about it. And then pace came in about it was eighty four, but it was probably about eighty five ish by the time it actually came in and we moved to tape recorded interviews. So I wasn't really I hadn't done a massive amount of interviews pre pace. To be honest, I've done some, but not that many. So it was good for me. I was still relatively young in service. Suddenly, these tape recording machines appeared in the interview rooms, and all these safeguards around warrants and searching people and keeping people in detention for how long and how, you know, all the safeguards around that. So I think I was quite lucky that I still had my kind of studying head on, having not been out that long, and I could take it in. Whereas some of the older bobbies were 
were pretty lost really because they'd been used to many many years of doing it the way they did it and suddenly they were being told to do it really differently and it took some getting used to it was a breath of fresh air for a lot of people because they didn't have to sit i mean obviously interviewing a suspect is you want it to be they want, you want there to be a flow you want there to be a conversation even if it is just a chat a conversation you know you want to ask the questions you want it to be natural whereas pen and paper you know you've got to ask the question you've got to write the question down at some point then when the answer comes, if it does come, you've got to write that down. It, it kind of knocks the flow to pieces. There's no kind of, there's no natural thing about it. Whereas a tape recorder, you just press a button and you're talking and you just keep talking until the tape stops or you finish your interview. So much more natural, better, more more beneficial for, for interviewing people and much easier. You know, you still have to often transcribe the interview afterwards, you know, so you'd have to go in a room with little headphones and play it and then write down the salient points. So you didn't get away with the writing of, in all of it, but it was a lot easier to, to interview people and a lot easier to, to manage a lot of things. And it probably, I mean, it's one of the biggest bits of legislation. I think it's probably one of the best because it just safeguards people a lot more. You know, so solicitors are far more prevalent now in interview situations. You've got your safeguards whereby, you know, if it goes to court, if you haven't done it right, you know, the case could be thrown out quite rightly too if it's something that's been done wrong. So I think it just made it, it made a difference to us. I was fortunate, I was early on in my career, but a lot of the older bobbies, men and women, some of them struggled a bit because it was just so different. We're not used to doing this. What do you mean, take the recorder? How does that work? You know, what, what happens if it goes wrong? And you know, this sort of thing. And because you, you do, people do get they have concerns about that when things change from what they've been used to, even though they might be better in the long run, it just takes that little period of getting used to it really. It was the pretty much the exact time that the bill began was was when pace was coming in. So you yeah. had the old school Sergeant Cryer and Larry yeah. Dan, Sergeant Peters, and they were like they were coming to terms with the characters. And Ted Roach, like not a fan of of pace, you know. So it was perfect, really, for that kind of beginning. I mean, how on your radar what were police dramas in general? Was it something that you and your colleagues actually? paid attention to what was on the box or suppose if you were working yeah it didn't really, i think it's one of those if it was on and you were there in the section house because the telly was always on there was always people in there off nights or waiting to go to work or day off and they weren't going out somewhere so the telly was always on if, if it was on you'd watch it of course you would and i think there were probably one or two that would look for it and spend time watching it but i think the main thing was you were so either so tired or you were actually at work with the shift patterns that it was kind of it didn't dominate but i know a lot of people liked it and, and spoke quite quite fondly about it because it was so it was so based in reality it was it was it's one of the i mean i watch things now sometimes on tv and and you see some of the things and, but, and, and i know it's drama and i know it'd be really dry if it was how it really happened but some of the things you see you think well how does that work kind of thing what why is that but yet because the, the bill had obviously advisors Kind of by the looks of it, almost all the way through, if not all the way through, and they were coppers, you know, by the looks of it. Uh, what better advice can you get for people that have either already done it, experienced it, or you know? And I, and I know some of the people worked with the, the, the cops in the Met as well. I think didn't they? Yes. Some of the and people that's spend right. a bit of time to get their role, so they got their role right. I mean, that's brilliant to be able to get things right because you're experiencing it and you're spending time in the station. You're talking to Obvious and things like that, fantastic. So I think we were aware that it was on, and I used to watch it, not religiously at that time, but I always enjoyed it and always thought it was a it was a good program. And probably I'm not sure whether there was too much else on around the around that time of the early eighties and the mid mid eighties, but it was one that I would watch if it was on without doubt. I'm a, I've always been a fan. But my myth is Jane, because you kindly signed the book for Jane. Yeah. Is that what you'd probably call like a super fan? I mean, we we both had, we were both divorced. And when we met, I was obviously in the police. And she didn't know at first that I was a police officer. Even now, she's got all the, she watches all the bills on the old channels on Sky, like drama and whatever else it's on. And she, she, she records them all. So when you look yeah. at her planner, it's like, I don't know how many episodes of the bill and she just goes all the way through and then it starts again and she i mean if she ever did mastermind that would be her kind of special. oh oh fantastic I mean, yeah it's really really so that was i mean obviously the book was for me as well but 
I just thought that would be quite a nice little touch for her. And she sort of, especially when it's in the early series as well. I mean, she's, she talks about it now. She just, I mean, I enjoy it as well, but she just really, really loves watching the bill. As you can tell, you know, you mentioned the characters. And also what she does, which is really good, actually, we're watching like a drama or some random program and she'll say, he was such and such on the bill. <laughs> he was a kid. You know, it's about a set and she's right. You know, we look, oh, we'll Google that and you Google it. And yeah, it, what it was, he used to, he or she used to be in the bill. It's like, wow, this has just got a really good memory for faces and recognises them from, even if they're, you know, a lot older. It's unbelievable. Which characters for you were like the most believable, the most true to life? Who do you think got it just right yeah i think really because i probably experienced it in the early stages i think virtually every station in the met had a red hollis <laughs> i do i mean i can think of somebody on my relief <laughs> my shift it was, it was like reg brilliant but just a one-off kind of thing so reg without doubt every station had a an experience normally a man but not always a man uh, a sergeant who would put your put their arm around you and that, that voice of reason who you really did look up to. So I'm thinking maybe Sergeant Cryer would fit that bill really. Somebody that you could trust that wouldn't take any messing around, would tell you how it was, but would support you if if you needed help. I always liked Gina Gold as well because we had a we had a uniformed inspector um that came into our place and she was brilliant and you know a real character but really got stuck in and kind of was a great leader and she was in a difficult position because at that time there weren't that many women in the job particularly there were quite a few but in senior positions you know going up from inspector upwards there were very few there's loads now um, but then there weren't that many so a challenging position a tough one for a woman especially with some of the stereotypes i mean i experienced the stereotypes when i first joined particularly in cid around being politically incorrect and all that sort of thing absolutely awful not everybody but some of them so they were quite challenging times for the women in the force then particularly of a of a management level because they were telling people what to do so i liked i like gina gold cid you've already mentioned ted roach burnside jack meadows there's, there's a few of them that i can i can think of characters that i could match you know if you played a little game and you had a set of cards <laughs> and i've got the bigger ones and you've got the kind of characters you built but i could kind of play like snap and match match him oh. up real life characters because yeah there were there were some really the, the characters that that the bill put in and particularly in the early years it carried on throughout but the ones that i remember seeing were just so so realistic there was never a time when you'd say well that's not right or you know you wouldn't do someone like that because they were all they all had their own little stories and they all kind of behaved in certain ways and even when you move further on you get that horrendous story with them. Um, with June Ackland and um, Gabriel Kent. Yeah, yeah. Top Kent, power, Kent yeah. was seen. And I uh, just like, you just think, wow, it's sort of very, very well, well written. So yeah, there were a lot, there were quite a few of the, of the characters. Tony Stamp is every, every station has got an area car driver that was like, I mean, area car drivers when I joined were like, God, they sat at a different table. I wouldn't say it was quite as far as you, you had to ask to speak. It wasn't quite like that. But you had to earn your respect to get on that area car as, a, as an operator sitting next to them. And once you've got a posting on the area car as an operator, you were kind of, you've been accepted. You know, it was literally like that. There were one or two that were quite tricky that would like, this is my table. If anybody sits on it, you know, it was like, it was literally like that. Not all of them, because as, as time moved on, they got younger and younger and things changed massively. But there was a time where the area car driver was like the most important person. And I think Tony Stan, because he's such a nice bloke and a nice character, again has got that, got that, got the respect automatically just because of the type of person he is. You know, just, um, just great, really. Really enjoyed watching them all. And that those sort of old school, um, you know, the more prejudiced uh, detectives. I mean, were they good thief catchers? Were they good, good coppers? If something happened in the pub, they'd be absolutely brilliant because most of the time that's where they spent a lot of their time. It sounds awful, doesn't it? And that's not all of them, but uh, quite a few of them in various different stations were actually quite lazy. So you've heard the phrase, talk a good job. That's what we used to do, talk a good job and not necessarily 
do one. I mean, they were in the minority when I joined, but you could you could spot them a mile off because you could hear them talking about the job that they did and how they were doing this and how somebody had got something wrong. And there, there was a drinking culture, especially when I first joined, which I had to kind of get my head around because we used to like going for a drink off shift, you know, but some of these people used to be in there because of the CID and whatever. And they were cultivating informants, of course. Yeah, they were. They were doing that sort of thing. They might be working undercover, but they used to spend quite a bit of time in the pub as well. There was a kind of a bit of a culture around detectives in those, certainly in the 70s and in the, in the 80s as well, I think, whereby it was it was so far removed from where it is now and, and has been for many, many different years. You know, there's so many younger people now in, in, in CID positions. It's a, it's a much more diverse organisation for the better. Totally different um, animal to what it was when I first joined. Is there like a... Uh... A result you got personally as a detective that you're most proud of or like a case that was really hard to crack and you got the result yeah i think probably i mean just to finish off my story i, I, I left london for family reasons and i moved up to the middle east midlands and i spent 12 years working in the east midlands i was in i was backwards and forwards in uniform and as a detective i got promoted several times and i ended up investigating murder cases at the dci um, wow. So I was actually, I've been a detective at every rank from a constable to a chief inspector. So I I did quite a bit and I've seen. So if ever I was asking somebody to do something, it would never be something I hadn't done myself probably, which helps, I think, you know, it helped me anyway. Cases, there were many. I mean, I always used to think if I got some kind of justice or closure for, for a victim, but I suppose one particular case was a murder case that I dealt with it was a really tricky case because we were looking for two unknown people that had committed this murder. And we spent an awful lot of time and resources trying to identify these two people. Um, and it was a particularly awful case because of the work that we all did as a team with me leading the team. We managed to establish probably within about a couple of months, maybe that actually the circumstances of what had happened were completely different to how we first thought they were and had first been told to the point where one of the people who was actually uh, a victim and a key witness in the case turned out to be the suspect and responsible for the murder. Um, oh. you can imagine these, this person had family liaison working with them. They were supported throughout the funeral. of It was actually their partner who had died and been murdered. Suddenly, this information started to come and we build a case up over, as I say, probably two, three months to the point where I'm satisfied as the SIO in the case, in charge of the case, that this person has got a lot of questions to answer that we didn't realise at the beginning. Make the decision to arrest them, which is a massive decision, because it might be wrong, and what does that do moving forward? It transpired, cutting a very long story short, that actually they were responsible, and they then began to sort of um, come up with various different accounts to try and justify what they'd done, and eventually were convicted of murder after a trial at court. And the reason I picked that case really, it, it actually wasn't, I say it wasn't, it was within the last 10, 15 years, so it's not that long ago really. And I think I picked that one case because sometimes when you're investigating crime, there are clues there for you. It might be forensic, it might be a witness, it might be something else, somebody might ring in with some information. But in this one, we were completely kind of misled and misdirected from the very first 999 call which was actually made by the suspect to the police. So it was a real, and it, I say interesting in an awful sort of way. It was a, you know, it was one of those cases where if you lay out the facts from start to finish, at the end of it, you're like, wow, you know, has yeah. that really happened? But it did. And I think it was just really because we were able to get some, some kind of very small, admittedly, but some kind of closure for the, for the family of the man who was being murdered, who actually had no idea and had been treating the other party as a, a victim and someone who'd lost her partner for quite a few weeks and months, to then find out that that this person had actually was responsible for the for their death it was just, you know, it's, it's one I've never dealt, oh, I would never want to deal with again if I was in the service, but I'd never come across anything like that before. It was just so unusual. And I think it was just and also the fact that had we not done what we did as a team covered all that ground which took ages but it had to be done somebody might have got away with murder you know and that doesn't bear thinking about really 
My huge thanks to Stuart. There'll be more gold dust to come from him. In the meantime, you can follow the great man on Twitter at GIB Consultancy. You can also visit his website, gibconsultancy.co.uk, where you'll find information on Stuart's fantastic series of crime reference books, which are truly fascinating. And we'll be talking more about them in the upcoming podcasts. Thank you very much for listening. Stay tuned. In the meantime, here's the mighty Ben Payton to read our closing credits. Hello, this is Ben Payton, and you have been listening to The Bill Podcast. Produced and presented by Oliver Crocker. Co-produced by Ben Adams, Dan Evans, Sarah Kuiper, Alex Mockler, and Simon Wolf. Executive produced by Glenn Allen, Ben Ashmore, Daniel Christopher, Alana Dewar, Andrew Dyack, Paul Dunn, George Fairbrother, Stuart Gibbon, Erin Gordon, Luke Hegarty, Edward Kellett, James Ledane, Lucy McNeil, Stuart and Jen Morris, Claire Norbury, Justin Pitt, Tom Sherrington, Angel Stannard, Patrick Stratford, Sarah Went, and Michael Weil. Brought to you in association with GeorgeFairbrother.com and Misty Moon Events. Signed copies of Oliver Crocker's book, Witness Statements, are available from devonfirebooks.com. Hold up. 